Hi, um, my name's Bob Westervelt. Uh, today, uh, we're lucky to have a speaker from Princeton um, who is going to tell us about something uh, very interesting. As I was saying, I tried once to measure this myself with no luck. Uh, it turns out that if you have a, a one-dimensional Fermi gas that you lose the Fermi surface and the whole picture of little you know, particles running around in the Fermi, the Fermi surface no longer true. And so it's really a, a different, interesting uh, system. Um, and he's going to tell us about that. Um, uh, he got from USTC in China in 2010 and a PhD at the uh, University of uh, Washington uh, 2016 has been uh, Princeton uh, after that. Um, so I look forward to your talk. Uh, please go ahead. Yeah. Well, thanks, Bob. Thanks uh, for inviting me. And um, um, I will talk about what our recent experiments on uh, moray materials, as you see from the title and uh, uh, Bob's introduction. So uh, to talk about Latin the liquids, uh, let me actually, uh, I want to start to have a brief review, remind you what has been uh, at least studied. Oh, this is an old topic for decades, right? So, and then I will uh, come up with a question that um, uh, can we have large new liquids in two dimensions and hopefully to draw a connection to our experiment that I will uh, talk to you. So let me start with, um, uh, I have to mention Fermi liquid, right? Uh, that's the uh, uh, contrast that we want to do. Uh, to, in order to talk about Lollinger liquid. So it's actually amazing to realize that um, this Fermi liquid theory is so uh, successful while um, you know, we know it's described from uh, many metals that we uh, typically know. And um, uh, it's for, do, for describing interacting electrons in crystals, right, in solids. Um, but it turns out that as the Fermi liquid say, the theory says that uh, um, this interacting is not that important. It, the, the, the electrons in the material, in the metals, in, in typical metals, behave like non-interacting uh, Fermi gas, where you have uh, quasi-particle electron excitations, just like free electrons, except you have to renormalize the masses, right, a magnetic moment, and so on. But in, in, in general, it's, it's, it looks like you know, non-interacting Fermi gas, where you just need to describe the system here, right, as I show, you have a band structure, as we know, uh, typically in Fermi Cs and Fermi surfaces. It's key to understand the uh, fundamental quantum phenomena in, in condensed matter system, right? Like lambda quantization and uh, BCS superconductivity. So the, the question is, uh, uh, can we go beyond this, right? So we, of course, know there are a lot of evidence that there are non-Fermi liquids, uh, but we are not very, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, know a lot of details about non-Fermi liquids, which can actually already be reflected by uh, the name. We call it non-Fermi liquids, just like we know uh, the, there are fish in, in oceans, but we don't know much about turtles and, uh, you know, uh, 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 lobsters, so we call them non-fish, right? So Latin G liquid is one of the non-fish in, in condensed matter uh, system. Um, so it's kind of, uh, it's not as well established as Fermi liquids, arguably I would say, but it's uh, better understand compared to other non-fish, right? other non-Fermi liquids. So it's uh, first coined by Duncan Hardam uh, in 1981. Um, the, the only key part is here is to have your metal, uh, uh, only the electrons in the metal only uh, moving one dimension, so the 1D metals. In that case, you already know it's very special in terms of the uh, band structure and Fermi surface. Here, the Fermi surface is only really only two points in this simple case, right? So in, in such one-dimensional metals, uh, it has been realized that uh, even weak interactions can lead to very strong electron correlations. And that's the key uh, to uh, drive the system, uh, deviate from um, uh, Fermi liquids, uh, instead behave like a Lollinger liquid. I would like to mention briefly two, um, I think, a unique aspect of 1D metals comparing to 2D metals. The first is if you think about uh, 2D or 3D metals, electrons in the system, um, if you want to move, say, uh, one particle or one electrons, it may cause a response of nearby electrons, right? so it's a local response to screen the, the, the motion that you would like to induce, while in, in, in in places where far away from this uh, moving electrons, you, you don't see much of the response there, right? Because of the screening and so on. However, in 1D, it's very different. If you have electrons, you know, only moving in one direction, but not in 
the other two, then if you want to move any one of the electrons, it has to push the electrons next to it, right? And then this electrons have to push the, the one next to it again. So, uh, which means uh, in one dimension, the system are in, entirely correlated. So any local excitation will essentially a collective motion of the entire system. Um, so the second uh, aspect, you can see the unique aspect of 2D, of 1D metals is seen from uh, this, um, uh, that is a momentum space, as I show in the bottom. So we're uh, in 2D case, where if, if you have a, say, a circular uh, Fermi surface, then if you look at the electron excitation spectrum, where you have, uh, what, what I'm showing here, the plot is an energy and momentum plot for the allowed uh, excitation shown as a gray. Uh, so which means if you look at here, for any given low energy, right, given the energy, you can find a solution or, or no, excitation at uh, arbitrary momentum between zero and two kf, right? Because you can uh, reduce the moment, you can easily see from this a sketch here. However, it's very different for 1D metals because you only have two points as a Fermi surface. Now, if you want to excite electrons, you can only, if you're near, you know, could, Near, near zero, you can only excite from hole to the electron at this band, right? So which means you have a large uh, space in the diagram here is not allowed. So you're, you're really the low energy, low momentum excitation is a well-defined single curve uh, that you know, describes the, the fundamentals of the collective excitations. So for this type of 1D system, very different from 2D and 3D, if you consider interactions, it will, uh, this is, this is a, a Latin illegal theory model, so it can be very well uh, calculated. Right? I'm not going through the details, but the consequence is very clear that you will see very different from the Fermi liquid theory, you just renormalize the electrons. But there, right here, you, you actually introduce dramatic change of the Fermi surface, which is described by this um, uh, power loss suppression of the uh, uh, particle, uh, single particle density of state, which means that. If you want to add electrons to the system, it's not easy. You have to pay energy different from the Fermi gas, like Fermi liquid theory. So the more energy you have, the higher probability uh, you can for you, for example, adding one electron to the system because of the correlations. So uh, and so the density state is uh, at the Fermi surface, it's a strongly correlated system, it's described by this power loss separation with the exponent eta here. And of course, eta zero when you have don't when you don't have electron uh, interactions. So that's one aspect of a uh, Lattinger liquid. The other is uh, a very interesting, uh, uh, which is uh, that excitations happen in this 1D system. It's no longer electron-like. It actually has a fractionalization, fractionalization process. Uh, the cartoon I'm showing here is based on a 1D uh, anti solid, but in, in general, the metallic, the liquid state also shows similar uh, feature. Uh, what you can see here is if you have such 1D electron solid, if you move one electron, which means it create a hole, and then the motion of the electrons <clears throat> will of course create, as I've shown here, right from the top to the bottom, uh, a single defect, which is a hole in, initially, uh, will become hole on and a spin on, as I uh, draw here, become two um, defects uh, uh, that's propagating uh, differently in the material, right? So this is phenomenon of spin charge separation is also fundamentally different from the Fermi liquid. And that's uh, one of the reasons why this is so interesting uh, to study 1D metals. Of course, this is not uh, new. This is um, well studied, well documented uh, for decades and, and different materials from, uh, from single nano wires, right? As, as Bob has mentioned, to engineering quantum wires um, where uh, Amir Yacoubi has actually done a lot of pioneer work on this to study both the tunneling effect into the system and uh, effect of spin charge separations. A lot of other uh, material systems, including uh, 1D topological edge states and quantum hole system and topological insulators, and also uh, organic conductors, self-organized wires. So this is a very generic um, uh, phenomena. If you have one dimensional conductors, you will expect to see large liquid behavior. That's basically uh, what we have learned from uh, the past several decades. Now, the question I want to ask here is, um, uh, can you have large liquid behavior for electrons in two dimensions, so two D metals? Now, this is very, uh, I think, very intriguing questions because uh, it's actually asked, can you have a non Fermi liquid that mimic a large liquid in two dimension, right? If you do, then you can ask, you know, immediately the follow-up questions. For example, in this such 2D system, 
can you have a, a number quantization, right? This is, you cannot ask this for 1D because in 1D, uh, we don't expect to see any uh, lambda quantization, right, typical. But in 2D, that might be possible or not, right? So that's uh, a question that we don't have a clear, definite answer, both experimentally and theoretically, right? So it's, uh, it's uh, a lot of interesting questions, in, including uh, also superconductivity, right? Can you use, have spin charge separation in 2D and so on? So that, that's the really um, uh, a motivation that I think um, is very interesting to us. This is not a, a new question as well. It's a, uh, this concept of two-dimensional Latin liquid was first brought up by uh, Phil Anderson uh, three decades ago. He was trying to use this idea to explain the cuprate phenomena for unconventional superconductivity. And there, you know, this idea generated a lot of uh, debate and, um, of course, we know the cuprate problem is not a solved problem. So it's uh, so far as the concept is still not established. Um, I, 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 so it's a very exotic concept. Uh, an easier question, or maybe a more straightforward question, uh, you modify a little bit to ask, can you have large liquid physics uh, not emerge out of the right, a pure Tudor system, but can, can this physics survive if we put an array of 1D wires, which means you start with something you already know, you have 1D physics, you have like liquids, for example, you have a wire, but then you arrange them together to, to, to couple them in parallel so that you create a 2D system and you turn on interaction between wires. Now you ask, um, and can I have stabilized large liquid physics in such an isotropic system, right? Especially down to zero temperature. That's, uh, if you do have that, that means you have a, an isotropic 2D system that uh, mimic Lavinger liquid. And then you can ask uh, uh, what's the you know, consequence of that for this non fermi liquid in 2D. Right? So this is, a, 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 I think, a very interesting question. And we can actually do some analysis based on um, uh, what we already know um, through the past decades, um, uh, uh, several decades. So how to think about this problem? Um, if we want to couple 1D wires, there's actually a lot of theory on this. It's a couple of Y constructions. Let's assume you have um, uh, uh, wires that are that you know you basically have a rectangle unit cell, for example, right? And then a hopping uh, along the short um, uh, distance uh, uh, between the, the the sides, which is along the Y, right? Uh, you have a T parallel, and the hopping for electrons uh, across the Y have T per perpendicular. So if we have a T perpendicular much less than T parallel, then you have this anisotropic 2D system, right? So if T perpendicular is much less, and then you have a temperature regime where your temperature is in between, right? T perp is less than, much less than temperature, that much less than T parallel. Then here you actually have a quasi 1D system because you know, T perpendicular is not important anymore, right? So, but this, this quasi 1D system only behave at a finite temperature range. So if we have a too high temperature, it's, it doesn't work. It becomes uh, uh, iso isotropic. Um, the question is, um, if you lower the temperature, right, then you will see a crossover that this 1D behavior will become 2D at very low temperature because at very low temperature, T perpendicular now is important. Right? So you expect to have a T star that's described by the T perpendicular uh, as a cross temperature. Now, uh, if you have large liquid physics here, you have to uh, consider interactions. So within the wire, each wire, so intra wire, you have large liquid phys physics turn on, right? As I mentioned previously, large liquid will suppress the single particle tunneling because um, uh, uh, you know the, the single particle density of state is suppressed by the power law exponent, right? Because of the electrons in the one D now is strongly correlated, so they don't like you add one more electron or move. The other electrons. So you can understand this in, in a way that you know the interaction, intra y interactions, the Dallinger liquid physics will suppress this crossover temperature T star to a lower value. Right? So this is the calculations that uh, um, I am showing here. So the eta is the uh, describing the uh, interactions in inter, in intra wire, so the Dallinger parameter uh, related to Dallinger parameter. So if this is zero, you got T perpendicular non interaction. If eta is big, then as long as you have a T perpendicular less than T parallel, then T star will be suppressed, right? So this is indeed the case. Uh, uh, if you see, actually has been seen in quasi uh, 1D conductors, uh, polymer conductors in different systems. 
this suppression of the uh, crossover temperature. So what I'm plotting here, uh, by the way, there's also a good textbook that you can uh, read if you like. So the crossover temperature will be suppressed if we have an interaction that develops, in, intra y interaction develop in a system. And that's a very interesting point where you have eta equals to one, right? Then you have you, the, the, the temperature crossover temperature is completely suppressed, which means if we have strong enough interactions in the wire, then the single particle hopping process is, is, is no longer relevant. It's not, uh, uh, you, don't have, you don't have to cross over to 2D in this case. Uh, in that, so your large new liquid may survive, right? However, the, the entire process here, we only consider uh, single particle hopping. In, in real case, we have also considered two particle hopping process and so on. So that's a more complicated situations. Uh, in general, you actually can uh, run into, so at very low temperature, you, you generally expect to have a, for example, two particle process can create a, a city charge density wave insulators, right? You have the transitions um, uh, to an insulating state. So this problem, so then you can ask, can we, uh, is this really uh, an always the case that you will turn into insulator or, or to the Fermi liquid, right? So can you find some situations where the, the nonlinear liquid physics survive in this anisotropic system down to zero temperature? So this theory, uh, we have, I'm enlisting a, a number of very interesting, important work, I think, in, in uh, two decades ago. So they, a number of groups, including uh, Ashring, uh, Vishnava, uh, Vishnava, uh, they worked on this problem and they reached out the conclusion is, is the following. Um, we don't need to go through details, but the, the conclusion is that if you fine tune the interactions, which is shown here by the stiffness parameter for the Lalinger model, where um, lambda one and lambda two is a parameter describing the interwire interactions um, between the next between nearest neighbor and the next nearest neighbor. So you have to tune these parameters so that fine tune them so that at some region uh, shown by this shaded area, um, you can have stable uh, large liquid physics in this uh, array system. Um, they call the sliding large liquids or uh, somatic metal. Um, um, so the key in here is that once you fine tune the parameter, you can have a, a regime where single particle and two particle process between wires are all relevant, e all irrelevant. So you have a, a stable large new liquid physics. So basically, basically the result is that each of the wire, even though you have interwire interactions, but they're not important, the system behaves as 2D array of large new liquids. So that's the uh, background that I want to uh, mention, which will bring, uh, put the, our experiments in, in the context. So what the question I want to address is, uh, uh, well, first of all, this, this isn't, I'm not, you know, know all this and then try to find an experimental system to realize this, uh, this phenomenon. It's not the case. Uh, in reality, is we, it's a discovery uh, that um, I'm going to talk to you about the experiment. So uh, we uh, study the system and then we realize that uh, what we think is very similar to, very relevant to what I'm talking about. So that I'm going to talk about this, uh, the experimental system that I think um, uh, is very interesting and, and relevant to this uh, important questions. So the, the material I want to uh, talk about uh, is tungsten ditellarite, a unique uh, 2D material. Um, it has, I'm showing the lattice structure here. So it has uh, three layer of atoms uh, for a single layer, a single uh, um, uh, uh, 2D sheet. So the red here is the tungsten and the blue is a telluride. So uh, tungsten in, in, the, in the middle layer from the side view. And from the top view, you see that uh, uh, TE atoms forming a hexagonal lattice, right? Um, so, and then, in, in the middle of the hexagon, that is, you see a, a red, which is a tungsten. However, this, this is not in the exact middle of the uh, uh, TE hexagonal, it's shifted, right? So um, this is a, a distorted 1T lattice structures, which is very unique to tungsten dipolarite. For example, in TAS so and other TMDs, they often have hexagonal structures or the 1T structures. This distortion here is very important. Um, it produces uh, the topological state that we have previously uh, discovered in this system. So it has a lot of interesting phenomena in this uh, 2D crystal, including um, uh, it, it's the, the, the topological insulating states, 
while you tune it, it can make a superconductors. And we recently argued that uh, it's also an external insulator uh, for the insulating state in this material. So there's a lot of uh, uh, experiments and ob observations um, on this crystal. Uh, it's interesting because this crystal is, is in, in this here, right? Where topology, correlations, and spin of the coupling are all important in this materials. What I want to highlight is um, due to this distortion, you actually can see a zigzag chains in this crystal, right? If you look at this crystal, you look at only W atom, then you have zigzag chains. So, so this crystal actually is highly anastropic. And this aspect of the, of the material has so far not been very well uh, explored because it's very hard to study. Um, it became very insulating uh, for the monolith. However, uh, so actually what I'm drawing here, you know, it's not even more, it's not even very clear because you have, I, have to, I have to highlight this in order for you to see the zigzag. If I take images using a real experimental system, right? For example, the, what I'm showing on the left is a high resolution scanning TEM, transmission electron microscope. If you look at this material on the microscope, you immediately see the, you know, here what is where you see the zigzag chain of the of the W atoms as a bright spot, right? It's the one dimension. On the right is the STM topography of the monolith that we merit. So you immediately see the 1D lines. So it's a very anisotropic crystal already in the monolith. As I mentioned, the problems uh, uh, is that uh, we already realized in, in, in when we studied the monolith, the whole carrier and the electron types are very different and the whole is very anisotropic, but it's very challenging to describe it, to characterize it because it's so insulating at the condition. So what we choose to study is not the monolayer, it's actually a two layer, it's a bilayer, it's a twist bilayer of constant diterite. I'm not talking about any magic angle here. I just want to study two layers. Uh, uh, one of the motivation is that uh, if we have two layers, the electron screening effect is stronger, the interaction is less, you know, so that uh, the intuition is that you have a less insulating state so that we can well characterize the material, right? But I'm but more rare physics, physics is certainly important here, but what I want to emphasize is that all the genes, right, to the observation I'm going to show you uh, already uh, exist in the monolith. Yeah? So if you twist, the two layer of tungsten dietellarite, you see the moray pattern here, right? You already see, see this uh, zigzag chain uh, in the modern layer and then the patterns on a large scale for the twist. So the top uh, uh, moray is for all, everything, for all the two layer of WT, actually three, uh, six layer, right, so in total. In uh, the bottom, I only show the tungsten atoms, so it's make more clear. Right? You can see the uh, moray patterns. They form one-dimensional stripes, right? So you can imagine this if you if you think about the zigzag change is one line, then this more ray is perpendicular to the zigzag chain, as I showed here. So it's a one-dimensional ray. So the distance between the more ray stripes, right? So you can see uh, the bright stripes, br bright spot is the A A stacking, because the, the top layer and bottom layer they overlap. And the dense area is AB stacking, right? So the AA and AB and AA, rep they repeat. So it's a periodic pattern. Uh, the distance between the, the, the same sites, which is a, a wavelength of the moray lattice, uh, D is plot here. If you have, a, a, for example, five degree of the twist angle, you will get uh, about seven nanometer distance uh, between the stripes. So it's actually, you already see it, right? So the, the rectangular, Moray cell um, come from the original rectangular um, uh, super, uh, unit cell of the monolith. Here it's have a, it, but the problem is uh, the, the, the interesting aspect here is you, you enlarge the cell, right? You have a large, much larger cell compared to monolith in the twist. So you see now it's very similar to what uh, the problem that we want to look at. So we will see uh, experimentally how uh, the system behaves. So let me first show you the moray structure using uh, the real uh, microscope that we do. So we, we perform a conductive AFM measurement, pretty much like a STM, but it's uh, using an AFM system to measure the conductive, local conductivity of the material. Um, what we did is a room temperature. We don't have a low temperature data yet. But if you do that, if you make a twist angle, the twist the bilayer of tungsten dietellarite, it's air sensitive. So we have to use the uh, boron nitride thin layer to protect it. So this is the device that we made. And then we uh, scan the conductive AFM uh, map, which is shown here, right? You can see the 
uh, moray patterns that looks like stripes, right? I have a zoom in here, so we can have uh, we can identify. Uh, we, we don't know where is A and A B region in this case because we don't have model to tell us uh, which one has higher connectivity. But um, you can clearly see the distance between stripes about seven nanometers, um, which matches to what we expect for the five degree twist bias. So. Yeah, th that's what uh, we have um, uh, for the characterization of the uh, twist system. Now, next, I'm going to, if you have a question, you can ask me actually now, maybe it's a good time. I'm going to talk about the transport data um, on this device now. Any questions? Okay, I'll go ahead. Um, so the device we made in order to measure the transport is like this. We have uh, two gates. Um, everything's fabric fabricated in glove box because uh, because we want to prevent the, the de degradation of the flake. Um, the challenging part is here is right. You have a mono layer, so you have twist. We cannot do a lot of the uh, fabrication like graphene people can do, so we have limitations here. But uh, uh, the key is to avoid the conduction uh, that's that's not in the twist regime. So that's, that's the reason we designed this device. So we have to open the holes of this electrodes, which are covered by the boron nitrides to prevent conductions to the edge modes of the monolayer and the monolayer region. So which means at the end, we realize a device, as I show here, is to mirror, uh, 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 it's perform measurements like this, right? We have only elect electrodes only touch the middle part the interior part of the twist region and pass current inside uh, and mirror voltage drops between contacts. So once you do that, uh, we also fabricate a ring structure so you can see the uh, anisotropic uh, mirror the resistance along different directions. What I'm showing uh, here is, uh, is the mirrors along two orthogonal directions and they are clearly different, right? So the red curve is a resistance, four probe resistance shown here. Uh, so the gray stripes, oh, I'm trying to mimic the uh, gray stripes in the material, and the, the, the contacts are the uh, red or gray dot. Um, gray means we're not connecting them to any uh, measurement uh, instrument. But the, but the red is, is the source and drain a measure voltage. So, so you see, um, we can use the gate voltage to tune the carrier density. Right? Once you tune it, you can, on the left, you can have a very high electron dope. On the, uh, on the right. On the left, you, then you have a, a hole doping. You see a striking difference between electron and hole. Right? So you have how huge resistance for the red curve on the hole side, but, uh, but not uh, uh, that high resistance on the electron side. However, if you mirror a, another direction perpendicular to the red, like quite hard direction, and on the easy direction, then you see very small resistance over entire doping. So the log plot is on the top I showed you here. So top uh, right plot is the same data, but log here. So you see on the whole side, whole doping side, you have huge difference between the R hard, right? Um, and R easy. They, they differ by a thousand times, close to a thousand times. The difference, so R hard over R easy is plot on the bottom. So you can have a, a close to 1000 times difference Here's a two curve on the bottom plot. It is coming from two devices. So on the electron side, however, if you don't have an astrophy, the the resistance overlaps, you know, very close to each other. So you only have, you know, one or two. It's, uh, um, uh, it's isostropic. On the whole side, it's very anisotropic. And this is a contrast experiment, right? So it means that this means that your Experiment, uh, the anisotropy you see on the whole side is not by any measurement geometry. We just uh, we just change the doping, so it's a good contrast experiment here. So what we see is the uh, um, whole doping of the tungsten dichloride twist by layer is very anisotropic, and not the electron. We can also check uh, the different contact configurations. I'm just showing you the same physics, but uh, we can do different measurements using two pro measurements along easy and hard. You already see the difference in two probe measurements uh, on the left and also on the right, a different measurement geometry showing very consistent results that uh, the, the, the whole doping is very anisotropic. And you can also do gate dependence 
measurements. So what I'm plotting in the bottom, the color plot is uh, the anisotropy ratio, which are hard over are easy as function of top gate and bo bottom gate voltage. Right? So, so uh, along the diagonal is tuning the density and on the other diagonal is tuning the electric field. We see it has a huge density dependent on the electron side is blue, which means not anisotropic. On the red color, you have a huge anisotropy uh, for the whole side. So the measurements, you know, of course, uh, have to consider geometry factor. So in the, if you can do some simulations, you can actually estimate what the resistivity uh, ratio between the easy and the hard. In that case, we get a number around 50 uh, for, for 1,000. We have other samples, we can have 10,000 and maybe you know, 100. Okay, so um, this slides, I want to tell you that the transport along these two directions is not just different by the value, they're not just the different value, very different value, but also they are qualitatively different. Um, so the first plot is the same as before I show you already. Um, and then what I'm showing here is temperature dependent. So, so for each of the curve. So the figure B is, uh, is a temperature dependent down from 1.8 Kelvin to 200 Kelvin. So you can see the resistance increase when you decrease the temperature. It's more like insulating behavior, right? Along the hard direction. It's a very different behavior on the easy direction. The resistance almost not changes. At very low temperature, you, you, at whole doping and low temperature, you have to see the opposite trend. Right? So slightly increase at the high temperature for the resistance and then goes down. So the temperature dependent on tell us uh, it's dramatic difference uh, if you mirror the transport along the two directions. And, and uh, figure D is just an isotropic ratio for different temperatures. So it, it became highly, more and more anisotropic at a lower temperature, while the, the resistance characteristic, RT characteristic, um, is completely different. And this is consistent you see in two devices. In another, well, we now have more devices, but um, uh, at least for these two devices, you can clearly see the, the result here. So uh, then we have to interpret right, what's going on for the whole doping. Um, we immediately think, right, this might be correlated to the more stripes and, and the electrons doping, you don't see the anisotropy, but the whole carrier sees the more stripes and then develop one dimensional channels. Uh, so it's a 2D array of 1D channels that um, I described in the beginning. Um, then the question is, uh, do you have that into liquid behavior, right? So the consequence of the Latin liquid physics, as I also have mentioned, um, for transport measurements, uh, the easy one to check is the power loss suppression of the density of state at Fermi energy. Right? So if you convert this power loss suppression to the measurement, which is conductivity, uh, you will expect to see a power loss suppression of the conductivity if you lower the temperature. Or if you tune the bias, right? Temperature bias is also related to the energy. Um, so for the uh, small bias, you should have temperature dependent power law and for high bias or um, um, you should have the differential conductance that follows the power law. Um, this has been uh, seen uh, in, for example, carbon nanotubes, right? This is a real established transport uh, signature of the uh, large liquid physics where you only have single alpha, right? Uh, you know, you, you, you mirror the, you mirror the uh, conductance or differential conductance as function of both temperature and voltage, but the entire data should all follow uh, some universal curves described by this power law exponent alpha. Right? So um, we cannot, there's a difference here um, between this single wire carbon nanotube and ours. So in their measurements, they actually measure in the contact resistance as I show here for this paper. So, so they have a wire and then put a contact underneath in this case, and then it's a tunneling from the thermal liquid contact to the lactin liquid nanotube. Uh, in that tunneling process can give you this uh, power law process. In our case, we have a moray, right? right? And then we moray put, put the moray on top of the contact, we have gate. So the moray on the contact might be distorted and have different doping, right? Very disordered and so on. So you, you don't want to use a contact to do the tunneling. So you measure contact resistance, it's not very reliable. Uh, what's unique here in our case is actually what's inside the of the twist of, of, of the moray. There you have, if you think you have 1D arrays, then you can pass current across the wire. So instead of have a Fermi liquid, to a liquid tunneling in the carbon nanotube case, here we can very easily achieve 
Lalan, Latin Liquid Tunneling, Latin Liquid to Latin, Latin Liquid Tunneling, it's a wire to wire tunneling process where you should also reflect the power law process because each wire is, uh, is Latin Liquid has a power law suppression. So we want to mirror this to see if, if it follows the, uh, uh, the power law uh, expectations. So that's the experiment I'm going to show you. So what we're going to do uh, is to find a very highly anastrobic spot as a cross here, the white cross. So here's the whole doping. And then we're going to choose a conductance measurement across a wire. Uh, we want to do differential conductance measurements, right? So we'll apply AC and DC voltage on one contact and, and mirror current through the other. So immediately we see the power law dependence as function of temperature while we have a very small bias and zero, small AC bias and zero DC bias. So it's the conductance, zero bias conductance G here, right? What I'm showing uh, is from two devices on the whole doping. They both follow the power law pretty well with the power law exponent around one. And then you want to measure the differential conductance as function voltage at different temperature. So on the bottom right spot, uh, bottom left here is a raw data. We do nothing, just uh, record dv, di over dv as function of bias and change temperature. So you see that the data is taken by uh, from 1.8 Kelvin to 25 Kelvin, so over one decade, and bias um, over more than a three decade of bias, right? So the dashed line here is a V to the alpha, where I choose the same alpha fit to 0.98, same alpha fits from the GT data from this top panel. So I don't do anything, right? Just you can already see here the higher bias uh, curve indeed follow this dashed line with the same alpha. So you have one single alpha to describe the data, which can be a better seen here in the uh, right plot, which is the differential. All this, the same data, all the same data collapse into a single curve. If we just plot um, uh, the IDV over T to the alpha, which is alpha is determined. Uh, by the conductance in GT plot. So in this scaled plot, all data claps, which means you really only need single alpha to describe oil data. And that's the key um, predictions uh, for a large liquid. So we indeed observe this uh, very intriguing phenomenon, uh, a single alpha exponent uh, for the conductance. So we have gates uh, to tune the density, right? So we can uh, uh, see how this power law change with different gate density. Uh, electron densities that you introduce. So that's the data from so the T as function of T, right? So zero bias conductance T as function of temperature taken uh, for different devices at different temperatures. So the, at low temperature, right, which means below 30 ish uh, Kelvin to one ish Kelvin, uh, the power law, you know, is pretty clear. That's pretty much all doping. Um, and then in the, the inset shows that the exponent alpha extracted as function of the current density. Right, you see uh, in the whole doping side, you have a pretty uh, large alpha around one uh, and tunable, so changing over the, uh, with the density. And then across the charging neutrality, when you get to the electron side, the alpha quickly drops to zero. Right? And uh, this follows the trends that the, um, uh, of the anisotropic ratio, right? So if you get to the electron side, which is uh, isostrobic, then you have alpha almost zero. Alpha zero means you have omic. You don't have the power loss suppression of any uh, instant state. But um, at whole site, you have, uh, you develop both very strong isotropic plus well-developed um, power law conductance. What I'm showing here is a scaling plot at uh, choosing uh, three examples at whole sites, different doping. So you see uh, the data, right, follow the power law and the collapse quite well. Um, so the, 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 uh, the scaling, right. So this indicates the whole sites are in, indeed described by the uh, expectations of the large liquids over a wide range of doping where alpha has already been changed. So we, this, this is another interesting aspect of the 2D system is that uh, you can tune uh, the, the interactions or parameters um, using uh, easy, uh, easily using external knobs. Um, here's another set of data uh, from a, a different device, device two um, is more comprehensive. Uh, the plots are all similar to previous ones. The, the top arrow is the conductance T as function T showing the power law uh, uh, T alpha. 
And then the differential conductance in the middle uh, row is um, uh, taken from different bias, uh, as function of bias uh, at different temperatures for you know, different doping. Um, and then they all collapse in the whole site. In the bottom plot is, is the collapse, right? So the single alpha uh, scaling consistently collapse uh, at wide range uh, in the whole doping for this, the second device. And then the collapse became poor, right? There's not very good scaling in the electron doping when, where you have, uh, you, you, you don't have much uh, very strong uh, anisotropic. So you have uh, isostropic system. Then interestingly, you, you still have a good power law in TT. It's just the, um, the high bias data do not uh, follow this uh, scaling behavior. But I think the conclusion is that uh, we do see very good uh, power law behavior along uh, in the whole site. Um, so I have a brief summary of what we have already seen here. Uh, the key phenomena that we observed, first is that the, uh, for the twist by layer WT2 for small angles near five degree, you see very strong qualitatively different transport along uh, easy and, and hard directions and uh, very uh, large contrast between electron doping and hole doping. Hole doping is an isotropic electron is not. And the hole doping of a wide range of parameters, including one decade in temperature, three decade in, in, in voltage, more than three decade in, in bias voltage, uh, described by um, the single exponent power law behavior. And um, you can tune the parameter by twist angle and, and a doping over a wide range, right? This is still true. So the question is, do you have other explanations? We always want to evaluate whether this can be explained by other um, possible scenarios. First of all, it's of course not consistent with ordinary bands or mod insulators, right? We don't see a really uh, good gap, fully gapped behavior. Now one direction is very different to the other. So in a hard direction, maybe you, know, you see uh, insulating behavior, but you know, easy is not. And also the power law is not really the activations and so on, right? So the resistance uh, along the hard direction we mirror here is dominated by the bulk. So we choose the contact that has the low contact resistance compared to the uh, uh, transport across the wire, so which is more insulating. So which means the behavior cannot be explained by any contact effect. Um, the possibility of localization, I think that deserves more careful um, uh, a study, um, whether you can have a very special kind of uh, you know, localization effect, like uh, in, the, in the variable range hopping, right? You have disorder induced uh, uh, process that can produce a power law. So the argument here, um, I would say, is also not uh, feasible. Um, for example, in this paper, what I'm showing you here is uh, from 2010 uh, in PIL. So the authors argue that um, in various kinds of systems, especially in disordered 4C1D system, which is very similar to what we have, uh, you can have apparent power law behavior that's not from non hinge liquid, but from um, uh, some modified uh, variable range hopping, uh, which means disorder. Um, in the analysis, they um, pointed out, right, you, you can have power law dependence and not following the standards uh, variable, variable range hopping formula. Instead, you can, if you, you know, if you engineer a disorder, okay, then you can have a situation where uh, conductance of the T to the alpha bias also lead to the some excellent beta here, right? So uh, then that's the formula. So what's unique, what, what's what's interesting here is that even though you can fine tune the parameter to have power law, however, you get a very different exponent for the temperature dependence and bias dependence. So you have alpha and beta. They are not generally, they are not equal in, in general. So that's the, uh, here, the bottom of the slides, I show you the relation here. And the parameter like C2 is uh, random. It depends on your, your disorder in the system and other effects. So, it's a, so you have to fine tune a parameter in order to get alpha equal to beta. If you want to interpret the results using uh, localization. And in WT2, of course, we see alpha equals to beta. And that's the strong signature um, uh, against this. But even better is that we actually observe this alpha equal to beta phenomena over a wide range of doping, right, and different samples. So which means even you already tune the alpha, right? alpha is still locked to beta. 
So it's a very uh, strong evidence to say that the single exponent alpha, which means alpha equals beta, is gener gener generic to the twist WT2 system. And uh, therefore, uh, it's very, it, it'll be challenging if you want to um, uh, fine tune a some model like uh, localization to explain this um, locked alpha equals beta effect. So, uh, but still, we don't have good modeling so far. Right? WT2 is very challenging compared to graphing uh, for theoretical modeling. Um, so even the monolayer, right, we don't, uh, the calculation often have uh, deviations. So we have collaborators um, uh, from uh, uh, SIT, uh, Pramas Wana and uh, uh, Shivaji Sandi. They have performed some uh, early calculations on this twist WT2 structure. Um, however, this is, I have to emphasize this, they are, are pre very preliminary. It's not considering interactions and only a one uh, electron value has been considered in the, in, for calculating the twist bands. Um, so, so certainly, uh, uh, um, you know, much more improved calculations are uh, needed to consider the details of the system. However, they already show um, with this uh, simplified models, uh, you do have quasi 1D bands in the single particle. Um, what I'm showing here is the, the, the Fermi surface, which is open Fermi surface, right? Uh, got in here. Uh, but if you want to know, to know more details, you can click the paper. Uh, what I want to emphasize is that uh, we need a better modeling to uh, describe the systems, to consider the electron interactions, spin of the couplings, the lattice relaxations, right? And, and in, in, in more important, how to um, modeling the lattice in liquid physics here. Um, this is related to. Um, uh, how the observations that we have now uh, is connected to the sliding knowledge liquid that I mentioned previous. I think to what level we can uh, think uh, the phase here uh, may be described by this predicted uh, uh, quantum phase, which is very interesting uh, phase of the matter. So that's the unknown. We have to figure this out. Uh, but we can do some uh, analysis um, on the um, interactions already because. Um, from the single particle hopping angle, right? So because we already know the T star, right? We, we see the Lanier behavior survives down to at least 1.8 Kelvin in these devices, um, which means, you know, T star, the, the crossover temperature is less than 1.8 Kelvin. And then we can estimate the hopping between the sites, the Moray sites, but you typically, you can have mini EV level, even though, right? So we, um, we have a seven nanometer ish um, distance between the, um, between the stripes. So here you have um, several mini EV uh, hopping for the T perp. Then the T starts much more lower than that. It has been has to be suppressed by interactions, right? So um, in our measurements, we we measure the uh, tunneling between parallel wires, right? So if a single wire has a Fermi uh, surface exponent eta, then you actually expect um, to have a conductance power law alpha equals two eta minus one. Two eta just because you, you have um, two particles, right? So the joint density state give you a two, and minus one because you have a parallel, so you have a geometry factor. And the, uh, the point is that we can estimate uh, if we have married alpha, which is close to one, right? You actually have eta also close to one. If eta close to one, that's very interesting. That's that's the where we have mentioned that you may have completely suppressed single particle hopping. The question, of course, is uh, can you still have a two particle hopping or not? So that's something we don't know yet. And which means at lo even lower temperature, go to 1.8 Kelvin, will you will sample turn into insulator or even uh, in some cases survive as a large liquid? That's a very interesting question that we want to address. And uh, we actually have already some um, preliminary results, it's not published. Um, in a different angle, a slightly smaller angle, three degree device. Uh, by the way, I think I should ask any questions here. Do I have a, uh, how long? Mm -hmm. If I can, I can, I can go ahead if you don't have a question here. So this is a device is different uh, by the twist angle. What I'm plotting here now is, uh, uh, is very interesting. Um, we don't see much of the anisotropy. What I'm plotting here is anisotropy as, as function of gate voltage. Right? In the whole side, again, we see anisotropy. By the way, we don't see it at high temperature now. So an isotropy at two Kelvin in this sample is only around 10, not big. 
However, at ultra low temperature, it would go down to 50 mini Kelvin, the anisotropy increased dramatically to 10 to the four, right, 10,000. So this is really a very low temperature phenomenon now. And um, uh, we see a uh, very clear difference between the hard and the easy direction. So this is a measurement on an easy hard as a function of bias. So the hard direction, you have an insulating behavior at the peak. The easy direction, you see a dip here, right? This is not superconductivity, by the way. Um, this is because of the 1D physics. So, so you have a dip here because your probe contacts uh, no longer sense the current because source spring, right? The current pass through if you have a 1D uh, between the source spring, but not to the contact. Um, so the huge contrast here happened at a very low temperature, right, down to 50 millikelvin. And then we can check the power laws, right? Conductance G as function of T to develop a power law with exponent now is bigger than one. So the 1.5 uh, down to 50 millikelvin. You can see a very straight line here and very good power law scaling of the conductance at ultra low temperature. So I, I think, yeah, this is the, the data that we are working on now, but it's very encouraging that I want to say yes. And in this twist, constant ditelluride, more ray systems we can find um, uh, we can observe this large liquid behavior to the arrays of 1D large liquid down to um, lowest measurable uh, temperature, like 50 millikelvin. Of course, we want to answer, uh, we can then continue ask, right, what's interesting about this. So we will ask, for example, what happens if you apply magnetic fields, right? Do we expect unconventional quantum oscillations, unconventional superconductivity, or what happened to spin charge separations, right? So um, I want to mention two. Briefly mention two points, and then I think I can finish the talk. The first thing I want to mention is um, what happened to charge neutrality. Right. We know that charge neutrality, so you already, we already see it's so near NG equal to zero, density zero. Here's something special here, right? At very low temperature, maybe become an insulator. But we know at this point, uh, we expect to see coexist of holes and electrons right, with charge neutrality. That means you have a large energy liquid holes plus normal electrons. Uh, if this is the case, the Latin liquid holes may undergo spin charge separation, right? And we know this 2D WT2 system has a very strong exonic effect. In fact, we have already mentioned that the monolayer, right, is exonic insulator. And what happens if you're including exonic effect here? You may have a very interesting fractionalized exonic insulators, which is um, we already try to make connections to the monolayer physics. And that's one point uh, that I want to bring, briefly mention. The other very interesting uh, point is related to the couple Y constructions. If you apply magnetic fields, there's a lot of theory on this. Um, uh, actually now there's a lot of recent theory on this too. Uh, it's an old problem, but has a recent renewed theoretical interest on in searching for quantum boy effects, including uh, fractional quantum boy effects in this couple Y constructions. Um, with, without magnetic fields, so zero B each wire, of course, you can, uh, in a simple model, it's just described by a simple parabola. Apply a magnetic field um, that you will introduce the vector potential A that will shift the spans for each wire, right? So you, have, you will produce a more complicated bands by shifting uh, the parabola for each wire. There, you may mimic the quantum Hall effect. If you include interwire interactions, you can open a gap that very looks like. Uh, 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 London levels um, that you know you actually want to see whether you can see a quantum point effect in the non quantum liquid. Um, so that's all I want to uh, talk. And uh, at the summary slides, I want to mention that this the two dimensional totem dietelluride system in both monolay and twist bias is very interesting. Um, now I identify this as you know, actually, it's a very uh, unique spot with topology, fractionalization, and non Fermi liquid physics coexist in this uh, uh, material platform. And we can use this platform to engineer and discover new correlate phenomena and excitations. Right? So that's, um, of course, the, the challenge is uh, what's the next generation devices and a new type of environment. So I would like to um, thank this. Uh, this work is um, uh, done uh, by uh, uh, my postdoc, Peng Jie Wan and students, Guo Yu, um, uh, they really, uh, doing the, all the hard works, they uh, leading the projects, and um, in collaboration with um, Leslie Shroop and the uh, Bubble Covers Group, they provide us very high quality crystals. And the theory collaboration I already mentioned uh, from Seed and Shivaji, um, and 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 thank you all. Yeah. Thank you.
Okay, thank you very much. The way that we handle questions here is you can type them into the chat, uh, uh, you know, bar item on the bottom of uh, Zoom. We have says, will this uh, 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 talk be available on YouTube afterwards? And the answer to that is yes. Uh, Emily put a, a link uh, up to the uh, CIQM YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. um, you can also find the link on the ciqm.harvard.edu uh, website. And if you punch there, you can get uh, video copies of uh, uh, all of the talks uh, so far. So it's an interesting uh, site. Okay, um, in terms of questions, I have one from Philip Kim. Mm -hmm. He says, the bias fold HV is across two contacts with many wires in between. The bias foliage between individual wires can be very small compared with the temperature energy scale. Do we still expect power law dependence, question mark? Yes, uh, that's, yeah, that's a very interesting question. Um, let me go to my add-on. So uh, the question is asking, uh, let me get the, the, this one. So the bias that apply has DC bias across the wires, right? So the individual wires will uh, have only divided bias um, and this divided bias uh, will be small, yes. Um, but we actually apply a higher bias here. So if you look at the scaling, so the, the ball in the middle of the bottom plot, so we have EV over KT. In, in typical, because you already see the bias I apply is quite large, right? So, uh, which means each individual, so he has a 10 mini EV, right, in the middle of the plot. Um, and each, in, each individual uh, wires will have good amount of bias. Um, but the key here is look at this, the EV over KD plot. If we have only have a single wire tunneling, this tunneling, this, this turn on, uh, this turn on curve here, the, uh, well, sh this should happen around one, right? But here we it happen around 20 ish, right? So that 20 ish, um, you can say you have a gamma, uh, you can introduce a factor gamma here, gamma EV over KT. So that's the, consider the, um, uh, the dividing division between the voltage, uh, for the voltage between the wires, so which means effectively we have a 20 or 30 ish uh, uh, parallel wires in between. That's taking all the, uh, uh, um, the, the, the voltages. And uh, in reality, you also have puddles, charge puddles and the inhomogeneity, right? So uh, it should be less than the exact number of the Moray wires, um, but it uh, should be a, a fraction. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, we have uh, another question from Xu Wen Sun. Uh, except for the power law relationship, do we, do we have other signatures of using transport measurements, question mark. Uh, this, this is early results so far, not yet. Uh, this is the you know, first, we just, our, you know, our first paper on this. We only see this power line uh, uh, transport that I show you everything now. Um, but I think that's an interesting question, right? We should look for what's other unique evidence. Uh, applying magnetic field is something I think we're looking into. That could be very interesting. Right? How the, if you have really have the tunneling between wires, what happened? Uh, the perpendicular field, but we'll look for that. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, it, uh, other questions? Um, uh, if so, please type it in the uh, chat or the Q and A for that matter. I'll give you a few. Type quickly. Time for one last question. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thanks. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, a very interesting talk. It's uh, it's uh, interesting that you can get there. I mean, it's it's a, a difficult yeah. challenge to really uh, get these one dimensional systems line up. So very nice. Thank yeah. you. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Yeah, bye. Thanks, everyone.